Hello. Italics have been part of the Latin script typographical landscape for over 500 years, and yet their design has remained a mystery. There are many articles written about the history of particular italic designs, but very little about why they were designed that way. What influenced designer decisions? What processes did they use? And what does that process look like for designers in this century? I'm Victor Galtney, a type designer with SIL International, and I also work with MA students at the University of Reading, helping them learn the craft of type design. And I want to share with you a brief look into the results of a five-year research project at Reading to discover and document how designers create these secondary script Latin italics. Do they just slant the upright and make it curvy? Or is it more complex and nuanced? The full 270-page study will be published in a few months, but I want to give you a peek at what I've found. To give you some basic background, I looked at whatever I could find in the published literature about italic design, but also at type specimens, promotional materials, reviews, anything that might give clues to how the designer made decisions. Then I interviewed 23 current designers from a variety of backgrounds to see how their processes compare to historical patterns. And although there is no single common ideal process for creating an italic, in fact, there's a wide variety, there is a general pattern, a set of five phases that describe what designers consider. And this framework for designing italics can be helpful as we look at existing italics, design new ones, and even consider whether the concept of italic has relevance for scripts other than Latin. So how do designers approach an italic design? What questions do they ask? What decisions do they need to make? These questions and decisions seem to cluster into five phases that begin sequentially, but then continue in parallel as adjusting as necessary as new questions and factors arise and new decisions are made. And this process begins with establishing context the purposes and boundaries of the design. It continues with style influences, how historical patterns, user expectations, current trends, and even business competition affect it. Then deciding about working methods, which design tools and techniques to use, both manual and digital, to create the letter forms. Now the first three are actually not unique to italics, but italic introduces additional complexities and challenges. The next two are unique to italic and focus on managing what I call italic tension. We'll get into that more in a few minutes. So choosing differentiation techniques, discovering the particular mix of techniques that will provide the needed amount of differentiation from the Roman, and then determining connection with the Roman, deciding how to provide a perceived sense of connectedness with the Roman. And managing italic tension is balancing these two factors, differentiation and connection. Now let's look at the five phases in more detail. And I'll do this as if you're designing a new italic and need to make design decisions, though it's really a reflection on what I discovered about the broad practice of designers. So the design process begins with asking, why is it needed? How will it be used? What technical requirements apply? And a key issue here is how much differentiation is required for how it will be used. In other words, how much does the italic need to stand out from the Roman? For example, consider Gary Munch's Candara, a design whose italic is very close to the upright Roman. It works beautifully for long passages, is highly readable, and this italic can be very similar to the Roman with no negative effects. But if you really need differentiation, it doesn't work very well. It doesn't stand out enough. And there were technical reasons why it was designed this way. So you may need to design something that stands out, that draws attention, something notably distinctive in slope, curvature, letter forms, proportions, features. Take a look at Genon's version of Garamond and Grandjean. This takes all of these to extremes to make it clear difference between the words in the original text and the commentary. Now there may also be technical requirements that affect design choices. Will it be for print, 
screen, web, mobiles, an extreme metallic like this may be impractical on a mobile or a watch. So your first decisions are related to establishing the context, these requirements and boundaries. The next phase involves identifying style, identifying style influences. One of these is the role of history, established style correspondences that set expectations. If your upright is inspired by Didot, it's somewhat expected that your italic will follow a similar overall inspiration, even if the details are not identical. Though it's not always the case, you probably couldn't get away with using a humist sans. It would look too different, too disconnected. See, history provides a valuable and inescapable context for style decisions. Does the italic need to follow a particular style tradition, and how closely, or should it intentionally try to subvert that expectation? What will potential users want or expect? Now, italics can also have business purposes. They may have a role in promoting a type family. You may decide to put a beautiful virtuosic italic in with some lovely open type features into a font family, even though you may know it may not be used that much but it can play a part in drawing attention to the family and increase interest. Personal taste also affects these style decisions, and this requires some personal introspection and some humility. What aspects of your personal preferences and taste as a designer are appropriate for this italic? And which might you need to avoid? Uh, maybe you really like some quirky italic alternate forms, but would they really work in the newspaper face that you're designing? You need, you need to consider these style factors, historical traditions, user expectations, commercial purposes, and even your own personal style and taste. Now, once you've established these, you need to decide how you're going to make the letter forms. Now, even though italic has a clear, unavoidable heritage in calligraphic forms, Designers seem to rarely, if ever, use calligraphic techniques to shape the actual final outlines of the letter forms. Instead, they use tools like a pen or a brush to experiment with I forms and to get ideas. Or they may use them to draw or sketch out ideas with a pencil and paper or even on screen. Now, in many cases, the italic is just based directly on the Roman, digitally transformed and adjusted. Now, designers seem to use a similar process for this, although some of these steps are optional and are not always applied in the same order. They may they skew the letter forms, adjust the curves to reduce distortion, they may compress them, chop off the serifs, maybe optionally replace them, uh, slightly reduce the stroke weight, tighten and adjust the spacing, replace the A and G and other forms with alternate italic forms. And then they may use these as the final forms, or they may use them as a general template or guide to proportions and draw fresh letters that replace them, maybe with greater curvature. So remember that this is not meant to be a standard recipe. It just illustrates a common sequence of ideas and techniques to consider. Now, most of these individual techniques are used to push the italic further and further away from the Roman, but without losing a perceived sense of connectedness. Now Morrison, in his article Towards an Ideal Italic, got a lot of things wrong, and he later admitted it, like saying that the ideal italic was a sloped Roman. But he did identify the most significant issue in the design of italics, this tension between similarity and difference. And the next two phases in your italic design are all about managing that tension. Your first goal is to make the italic different enough from the Roman to achieve that level of differentiation that you identified was needed in the context phase. Now, there are six techniques that designers commonly use to do this, and we talked about some of them, but here they are in order of most to least used. Now, I should note that these are not necessarily digital transformations. Uh, for example, deciding on the slope of letters is, is relevant whether you're drawing them by hand or digitally transforming them. And I'm presenting these with a hypothetical scale that indicates the potential range of using the technique 
and a rough indication of level of how much it's commonly used. But please do not consider these to be recommendations of the right amount to use. The most common way to make an italic different is to give it a slope. Typical range is 7 to 13 degrees, though it can go from none to 20 degrees. The slope may vary between widths, optical sizes, or even between individual letters. Cursiveness is a subjective style characteristic that evokes the feel of handwritten forms, real or implied stroke connections between letters, a flowing or running texture, greater stroke curvature, things that harken back to the calligraphic tradition. Alternate forms may be used to introduce structural changes into the texture. And the most common are the single story A and G, but you could use others too. And they may be inspired by historical style influences. Flat serifs are often replaced with entry and exit strokes or terminals. Now these difference may differ in size or length or angle. And all of these aspects affect the amount of differentiation it gives. Italics are commonly compressed a little around two to 4%, but that can vary widely. And in some cases, compression is not appropriate, like for a monospace font. Finally, the actual proportions of the letters can change with or without width changes. Now you have to decide which of these to use and to what extent. The character and effectiveness of an italic is often determined by what mix or balance of techniques are used. If you use too few or are too restrained, then the italic may end up being too similar to the Roman. But maybe that's not a problem for its intended use. If you use too many and are extreme with them, then the italic may look unrelated to the Roman. However, even that can work, especially if there's some historical precedent. Your goal is to find that mix, that balance of techniques, that gives you the right amount of differentiation. Start out with a guess of what is needed, then test and adjust. The increased use of one technique can be balanced by reducing another. Adding more slope and alternate forms may allow you to reduce the compression and yet retain a similar level of differentiation overall. Now in the final phase, connection, your goal is to keep the italic in harmony with the Roman and other family members, despite what you've done to make them look different. Now, there are four techniques that are commonly used to strengthen that perceived connectedness. And again, your decision is which of these to use and how much. And here we're going the other direction, pushing towards the Roman. Similar identical letter form structures can strengthen the connection with the Roman. And the most clear example of this are capital letters. They may be simply sloped and adjusted Roman forms, even in italics that have strong cursive characteristics. Or there may be other structural connections, such as the same type of letter construction, like the interrupted or continuous construction as described by Nordsai. Equaling perceived height was one of the first techniques used to connect Roman and italic. Now, sometimes when you slope forms, it can make them look taller. So some designers reduce them one to 3% until they look balanced in height. A designer may incorporate specific features or motifs from the Roman into the italic, serif details, stroke endings, height and position of joins, or some other notable motif like a ball terminal. These give the Roman and italic a similar aesthetic and flavor. And a final technique is to try and balance the weight to give a similar gray value. Now, this wasn't important historically. They often did not match. But it seems to be more common and desirable today. As with differentiation, your goal is to discover the best combination of techniques to use. You may, however, notice that your efforts to keep the italic connected with the Roman work against your efforts to differentiate them. Well, then you can go back and add in more differentiation. And managing italic tension is a matter of deciding how much these two pull against one another. You may end up with a high level of tension with strong differentiation balanced with strong connection. 
or a low level with only moderate levels of each. Both can work and both can be effective. I presented this framework to you from the perspective of planning a new italic design, giving you an idea of what decisions you will face and what your options are. But the framework can be used in other ways too. You could use it to analyze an existing design, working backwards through the process. Take a look at an italic. Identify what characteristics it shares with the Roman, what techniques were used to achieve differentiation, maybe an idea of how the letters were formed. Note the particular characteristics that relate to historical models and see how the designer addressed context requirements such as technical limits. You can also use this in evaluating the effectiveness of an italic, although that's a highly subjective thing. But this framework can be used to make it easier to look at specific details of the design and evaluate how each of them contributes to the success of the design for practical purposes. Now this framework hints at some potential extensions, some further uses. A similar framework might be useful for other secondary styles such as bold. Uh, establish the context, the purpose, the boundaries, how it will be used, look at established paradigms, historical style patterns, decide how to create the letter forms, how to add that weight on, then balance differentiation and connection. It also hints at how we might approach the concept of non-Latin italics. Italics are by nature a Latin script invention, and as such we should probably begin with the assumption that italics are inappropriate for other scripts. However, in reality, the global typographical world has been influenced by how the Latin script uses that useful secondary style and may want something similar. And there's also that I button in many apps and people expect it will do something useful when you press on it, even for other scripts. Now the key may be in identifying which aspects of Latin italics, such as specific differentiation techniques, slope, cursiveness, alternate forms, calligraphic influences, etc., make sense or are reasonably applicable to the specific script in a natural way, and which make no sense at all. We need to break out of this assumption that non-Latins need italics that are slanted and cursive. Now, I'd love to explore this in far greater depth and with other voices involved, but I don't have time in this presentation. This has been a far too brief look at the italic design process, but I hope it has encouraged you to look creatively and more deeply at the issues and influences, and broken down any assumption that creating an italic is always a simple slant and curve process, even though sometimes it is just that. Now, over the next few months, I'll be publishing articles that go into more detail, including the full study itself, and you can watch for them at galtney.org slash jvgtype, or follow me on Twitter at jvgtype. Thank you. Would like to talk about. And I'll say my apologies for how fast that presentation went. I tried to, to cram in a lot of material into only 19 and a half minutes. Um, so you can always go back and hit that print screen button or <laughs> whatever you want. Um, again. Okay, Pedro. Um, hello, Pedro. Mentioned that. He'd love to hear more on the difference of grading the color between Roman and italic. Shouldn't they be sufficiently different to see in text? Um, that was a really interesting and surprising thing I found, um, both as looking into the historical record, but also talking with designers about their attitudes. And there seems to have been a real shift. 
traditionally, there was actually quite a bit of difference in weight between the italic and the Roman. It wasn't always lighter. Sometimes it was a little darker, in fact, because it was busier. I mean, if you even if you look at things like um, I'd see Gelliard, you know, Matthew Carter's work, actually the italic is darker than the Roman because it's so busy. And that works very well. However, more recently, I would say in the last 20 years, I'm seeing that people are grading and coloring so that the italic and the Roman seem more balanced. Now, one practical aspect of this that I found is when you have a document that has two languages, uh, let's say some EU um, publication. So, and you want to have some difference between the French and the German, but you do not want either of them to look dominant over the other. You can do that if you have kind of a solid even weight to them. They don't look um, like they're overpowering one another, but yet you can affect that difference in other ways. Um, okay, let me go back and see. I hope, Pedro, let me know if that covers it. Good. Ah, oh, let's see, what else? What led Griffo and Minutius to create the first italics? Um, they wanted to make money. Uh, that was the basic thing. Soon, you know, within a couple of decades of when the first humanist type came out, um, Aldous Minutius wanted to create a series of books that he could sell to the to the market out there. And he thought, oh, well, for this kind of book, what they're used to looking at are these books that are handwritten in this italic style. And so he thought, well, I will, I will commission Griffo to create a typeface that emulates this handwritten style. That way people are more likely to buy the books, which they did. Now, the trouble is, um, although Griffo did all the work, um, Aldous took the credit for it. And still today, you'll, you'll hear people say that Aldous invented italics, and he didn't at all. He was just trying to create an object that would sell. Um, Griffo was the real craftsman in this. Well, that made Griffo mad. And so Griffo packed up and said, I'll go to your competitor. And so he went down to Soncino and created the second italic, which was much better than the first. So in other words, the existence of italics in type was all about selling things. <laughs> um, I do plan to do a whole number of uh, recorded short talks all about different aspects of italics um, over the next few months. Okay, let me see, I'll try to take th these things in order. Um, let's see. Can I recommend any literature regarding the change of italics in optical sizes? Um, uh, nothing out there when, when my research comes out, I do talk about that briefly. And there are certain things which people do to adjust italics for screen sizes. A lot of those are reduced contrast. The same thing you do for Roman, really. You reduce some of the contrast, you add a bit more spacing, um, things like that. Okay, let's see. Okay, question about faux italics. I'll get to that in a minute. Let's see if there's any more things on Latin before we jump over to the non-Latin divide. Ah, 
Christian, um, about the use of italics in social media platforms, this is fascinating. That's one of the things I did, If um, oh, four or five years ago. One of the first things I did was, I and this was painful, by the way, I took and looked at all the tweets that mention anything about italics throughout the whole month, which were, you know, hundreds a day, and looked at what they said. And people on social media were desperate for italics. They felt that they could not express themselves adequately without italics. And so they came up with, um, I have a whole count of 40 different techniques people used to try to emulate italics, like putting, you know, underscores on either side or the best one, the best I found is just putting a slant, you know, a, a slash on the beginning end. Um, but they came up with very creative ways to try to say, uh, well, that word right there, I wanted that to be in italics, but social media won't let me. And texting, I can't text italics, you know, things like that. Have I come across any examples which would have done by a person who would not understand italics at all and have made created some new forms? Um, and Zanab, are you are you thinking are non-Latins or Latins here? Um, I'm not sure how to, uh, what you're trying to get at, Zanab. Um, examples done by a person who would not understand italics at all. Have me created, I'm not sure what you mean, understand italics. I think that's the, my, where I'm stumbling here. Maybe I'm misunderstanding where this is going, but um, are you saying people trying to come up with new italic forms? There's plenty of that. People do that, you know, often. Some of them are historically inspired, but some are just brand new italic forms. Yeah, I think it, it's as with Roman type in terms of can people come up with new new forms, people with no experience. Well, do people do that for Roman type? Yes, they do. Sometimes that, that's successful. Sometimes it's not. And I think that's the same true with italics. Um, the reality is, even if you have no background at all in the history of type, and you're coming at it fresh and new, the reality is you do have a background in, in the historical tradition because you see it all around you. And the question is how, how you respond to that. And you may come up with something completely new and that's fine, but you may also come up with something that is, um, um, that if you had had some historical better knowledge, you might be able to connect in with some of that historic tradition. <laughs> yeah, Zeneb, if you want to explain that a little better to help me understand what you're getting at. In the meantime, um, over in the Q and A chat, we talked about Ruka for Arabic. I'll, I'll, I'm holding off on the non-Latin for the moment until we have talked about Latin questions first before we jump into that. So, anything more that you want to discuss about 
Latins? Ah, yes, Lawrence. I, I've heard Toshi say this before, and I disagree. Um, Italic isn't doomed in the long term. Um, it doesn't work in social media, certainly. But it's still used in print. And actually, you're seeing it used more and more on websites. Um, now that we have web fonts and we can be more creative with it, people are choosing italic uh, more and more on, on websites. And so actually, there's probably been an increase in the amount of content in italics in recent years uh, because people can do that. And now with on our mobiles, we actually have screens that are high enough resolution that you can feed an italic web font to my phone and I can read it nicely. So uh, I don't think that has um, that has a you know sad ending to it. All right, second call for general thoughts or questions. Do slanted and true italics have a different voice? Um, hi, Boris. Um, Whatever choices you make in designing italics can affect the voice that you give it. If you, and whether you choose to do a slanted Roman or a true italic, although I'm not, it's hard to even to define what that true, what a true italic is. And I've heard a number of people talk about that, but it's not, mm. It's not clearly defined because this idea of whether between sloped Romans and true italics, it's not a black and white. There's a there's a continuum in there. Um, so whatever decisions you make, if you make something really slanted or really cursive, you'll you'll probably find that um, the italic will look more looks more strong. It'll stand out more. It'll yell at you. And it'll give you a different voice. Yeah. Hello? 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 Hi, Victor. This is Zainab. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello, Zainab. <laughs> Finally, I can actually Hi. ask you now. So, OK, I'm very sorry that you could not understand that uh, phrase. So what I meant is that imagine like um, I during your research, if you have come across uh, a person or an artist or a punch cutter, I don't know, um, that who never understand what was italic <laughs> or they might have just been, you know, uh, seen by the, the slant or the slopes letters. I don't know. Maybe they don't understand the term italics as well. So and if they have yeah. tried to uh, create something similar or, or copied something similar um, and they have uh, created something new out of it, like, you know, so would, 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 I don't know if, uh, if in your research, if ever something like uh, this would have okay. popped out. In my research, I was looking specifically at things that talked about italics. Yeah. So if someone created something and didn't identify it as yeah. an italic, yeah. I would I would not have paid any attention to it. Okay, so um, uh, so that person might have tried something, but then it would have failed or something like that. Even uh, those experiments were not. It, it depends on when you say you tried something. Okay. I think the question is, why? what are they trying it for? What's their purpose yeah. in it? Are they trying to create a secondary alternative to the primary style, a secondary scale style that will be used. Um, but bold is that, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of, there are different styles and variations you can do other than italic to show differentiation. 
and style. Okay. Okay. Um, italic is just one of the options you could use. Yeah. Yeah. Weight you can use color. Um, actually, color is used quite quite a bit in in like information design and things like that. I use that myself in um, in my presentation uh, to try to give just a little bit more emphasis to the thing on that slide I wanted you to look at. <laughs> okay. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's go back to other questions. Well, hope that that addresses it. Um, let's see. Francisco, um, what is your opinion about the design of slides? Do they need vertical extremes for better hinting? Would you accept slanted extremes too on your designs? Um, I think the way hinting technology works now is a bit different than it did you know, 20, 30 years ago. And it's less dependent upon extremes. Um, in fact, on some operating systems like, like the Mac, the hinting is virtually ignored, um, certainly in the X direction. Um, and so, and, and the rendering engines are, work a bit differently now. And you've also got higher resolution to deal with. And so um, I'm seeing a lot, a lot more freedom as people design italics to be able to, you know, put points in places that help make the curve um, what they want. You know, it used to be that you really had to stick things at extremes. Um, and then even if it distorted the curve a little bit, which is too bad, um, but you, you're, you're not, you don't need to do that to do any curve distortion anymore. However, I know that sticking things on the vertical extremes can still be very helpful for hinting, whether you're working with CFF or TrueType. Um, all right. Well, let me, let's go back to some of these the non-Latin questions. Um, you know, um, we talked about Ruka for Arabic script. You know, I have seen um, some designers, instead of taking, you know, well, Arabic script is this one situation where you have a big question about italics, which is, if you want something slanted, which way do you slant it? Do you slant it in the writing direction? or the other way, because that works better with other scripts. And I remember a few years ago, I was at a type conference um, where this came up and I was, I was sitting sort of between two very eminent Arabic script scholars, uh, both of whom, if they said anything, I would have no reason to question anything they said. And in succession, one stood up and vehemently um, argued that Arabic italics should go one direction. And the other person stood up and said the exact opposite. And what that hinted to me, and this is one of the things that was at that moment made me want to do this research um, even more, which is, that told me that that's the wrong question to be asking for Arabic. And one of the options is to not talk about just slanting back and forth, although you could use that, but there must be some other way to create a secondary italic or a secondary script that functions like italic, but better fits with the writing system. And one of the options that I know some of the students at Reading have explored in recent years is to take, uh, if they have a NASC Arabic font, to create an italic inspired more by the Rukah styles. 
Um, and I've seen that done very, very well. Although I'm no expert in Arabic script, um, I think that can be done very successfully from what I've seen and what I've heard other people say. Okay, now I'm catching up in the chat here. Okay, going back to some of the other things about uh, about non-Latins. Um, or one thing, uh, Lawrence had talked about faux italics for scripts where italic is not native. Um, I think if you asked someone by default, um, if you showed someone something like Hebrew and just slanted it, they would read it. And depending on their background, they would interpret it to be italic. They It would be effective in its purpose. It may not be pleasant. It may look odd or strange. But for some scripts like Thai, it works just fine. And that's probably the most acceptable way to do it. But for some other scripts, like Korean, mm, just slanting starts starts to look really odd. And so some people, Aaron Bell and others, have experimented with, well, what would a, a an appropriate italic look like? You can say the same thing for index scripts as well. Because, you know, there's a lot of slanted Devanagari out there. But what about other options? Um, I'm, there's a project that I'm, that's in kind of my queue of projects to do that um, involves creating a new italic to go along with an index script. And... Um, the typographic tradition for this script has no italic in it, but they want it for the same purposes that we want italics in Latin for contrast within the text. And what we sort of decide to do with it is to go um, to go back and look at some of the older manuscript styles, because there's also a desire to um, to have a font that emulates some of those older manuscript styles and that has a natural slant to it because of the way it's written. And so we're going to try to create an italic alternative based on some of the kind of movements and shapes and ideas within that older calligraphic tradition and use it to show contrast with the more modern upright typographic tradition. But also people may use that italic just on its own, just like people use italic on its own at the moment. Okay, uh, how about italics for Chinese scripts? I think, I think that's, I've had a lot of discussions with people about italic for Chinese, and um, I think it it's probably similar to what we see for um, other scripts uh, like Korean that don't have any italic. And the problem, of course, is that you have different writing directions, which makes italic completely make no sense at all. So for something that's just slanted, I. I, for most purposes, I hope that you can find a better alternative than just something slanted. Although people read it, people understand it. Um, what I really hope is that for Chinese, for Devanagari, for Arabic, for all these scripts where there is some aspect of italic that we, um, 
that works fine in Latin, but makes no sense in that other script. I'm hoping that designers will explore the other things, not just slope, that they ex explore compression, they explore weight differences, they explore alternate forms, they explore all these other things which we use in Latin italics other than slope and explore how those things might be applied to create a secondary script that functions typographically in a similar way to how we use italic in Latin. Okay, Antonio. Um, in terms of consistency, such as having an upright Roman and italics plus a Greek upright in italics, is it possible to have a very distinctive Greek compared to the upright Roman and then decide to bring some features into Roman italics? <laughs> Actually, um, the project I did many years ago, um, Gentium, the font that I started out at as an MA project at Reading oh, two decades ago, though the order I did that in, um, was I actually created the Greek italic first before the Greek upright um, because I, I wanted that dynamic nature and Greek has such a wonderful dynamic to it. Um, and it just felt felt better to give to first of all, kind of set that that Greek italic before I did the Greek upright. Now, I'd already done the italic Latin, but it wasn't set in stone. And so I actually did find that as I did the Greek italic, some of those ideas migrated back into the Latin italic. All right, anything else? I think we're we're getting toward the end of the hour here. Did I catch everything there? Is there some feel uh, please um type in the chat again if there's a question or thought you had that I've missed. Anything else? Grant, I hope that touched enough on non-Latins for you. Great. Well, thanks everyone for coming. I appreciate it. And stay tuned. I'll be saying a lot more in the months to come. <laughs>